Can we, just to wrap all of that up, can we give him thanks? The Bible says if you're going to pray, pray in faith that he's going to do what you need him to do. So if you were praying anything that was a petition, God, I need help with this, you should do it in faith that he's going to do it. Yeah. Right? So let's, let's take a minute and give God thanks for doing it. Even though we don't see it yet, Jesus, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for fulfilling every need, for being a provider, for taking care of us, oh God. We give you thanks. We give you praise in this house this morning. Lord, there is none other like you. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. And holy and blessed is your name, Jesus. We give you thanks. Hallelujah. good to see everybody this morning. Amen. Did we enjoy a shorter work week? I enjoyed a short work week. <laughs> we are We're going to look at something today in the book of Revelation. We're going to be looking at chapter 5 and verse 10. And then we're going to talk about it. Pretty simple. Amen. Matt, how hard would it be for you to put up verse 9 and verse 10? I'm going to go ahead and read it. If Matt's able to get it up on the wallpaper. We're still in John's vision, his revelation of Jesus Christ. And he's seeing these four beasts that are around the throne of God and these 24 elders. And the lamb appears and is able to open the seals of the scroll to bring the world to its conclusion. And... These beasts and these elders in chapter 5 and verse 9, the Bible says they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And that's the verse that I want to look at. You have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Matt, if you can put up 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. You, everybody say I. I. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him right. who called you, everybody say I, I, or me would be proper grammar, <laughs> called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Why? Yeah. Verse 10, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. That was, right. that was before. No. <laughs> That was on verse 9. <laughs> verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God, yeah. who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Yeah. Real quick, let's give God thanks for his mercy one more time. i got to get some thoughts straight. <laughs> so we're going to pray really quick. Amen. Amen. Lord, God, I thank you. I've been thinking a lot about what pastor's been preaching. <laughs> Novel idea. Walking in the spirit versus walking in the flesh. Um, pastor Alphen in Lincoln, he 
preached a message about jurisdictions, which jurisdiction you're going to obey, right? We live in, in Nebraska. We obey the state laws of Nebraska, and there are federal laws too, but the state laws of Arkansas do not apply to s us here in Nebraska. Right. There are differences. Yeah. So are we going to obey the law of sin and death, or are we going to obey the law of liberty and life through Jesus Christ? And I'm not going to preach his message this morning, but I do suggest you go back and, and watch it. It's on there, the Life, Life Church of Lincoln. Great message. They live streamed it. You can find the video. But Revelation 5, and verse 10, you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. What does it mean to be kings and priests unto God? That's what we're going to look at this morning. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 15 which he will manifest in his own time. We just lost our screen. Uh-oh. First Timothy 6, 15. This is why we need to bring our Bibles, amen? amen? Which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I don't have verse 16 in there, but I'm going to read it. Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. Who's this speaking of? Any guesses? Say it louder. Speaking of Jesus. <laughs> All right. Revelation 17 and 14. You get a gold star. <laughs> Revelation 17 and 14. These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for He is Lord of lords and King of kings. Amen. And those who are with Him are called chosen and faithful. Revelation 19 and 16. Did I put that one in there, Matt? Revelation 19 and 16. He has on His robe and on His thigh a name written, King of kings, and Lord of Lords, again, speaking of Jesus. So, what does it mean to be a king unto God? Well, first of all, it means that he is still king above us. Right. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of Lords. Now, if you go back to, we don't do kings and lords very much anymore. We have a president because we're... <laughs> whatever, we're above... We're above, I'm not going to go political, I'm just meaning we're, we're above having a king, right? We're independent, which is, I'm not saying we need to go back to having a king, but anyway, yeah, you were right, stay off of that. God is still the Lord of our lives. If we are wanting to walk in the spirit, if we are wanting to fulfill his word, if we are wanting to live a separated truly Christian life unto God, right. he has to be the king and the Lord of our lives. Right. right? So this does not mean, being a king unto God does not mean that we get to call the shots. Amen. Okay? Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 14. Now, God had a plan literally before he created anything, and he knew that humanity was going to fall into sin. He knew that we were going to have to deal with this flesh. He yeah. knew that we were going to have to deal with things like pride and ego. Yeah. And so when he calls the children of Israel out of Egypt and he sets them on their path through the wilderness with the, uh, I, the desire to bring them to the promised land. He starts to give them the law. When you enter the promised land, these are the things that you're going to do. And the, 
you read through that, and really what God was getting at was, I'm going to be your king. Egypt had a pharaoh. All of these other countries, they have a king. They have this. They have that. But when you come into the promised land, I'm going to be your king. And the children of Israel say, yeah, it's a great idea. Let's go to the promised land. Milk, honey, big bushels of grapes. Yeah. Woohoo! No rabbits to eat them. <laughs> and when, when God's giving them the law, he says in Deuteronomy 17 and 14, when you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it, and you dwell in it, you're going to say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. Yeah. And in verse 15, he says, you shall surely set a king over you. Right. Yeah. Now see, when they come to the promised land, and they, you go through the whole book of Judges, and then you eventually do get to the part where they start crying out, we want a king! And God says, this is a really, really bad idea. You do not want a king, and here's why. He's going to send all of your children to war. He's going to take all of your money and your livestock. He's going to mistreat you. Look, he tells the children of Israel, he says, look at me, right? Look at, look at God. What, where have I gone wrong? What have I done to hurt you? I literally brought you out of slavery. I brought you through the wilderness for 40 years. Why are you wanting to trade? But he begins to lay out these, this, this law of how a king should act. Because he says, Israel, you're going to choose a king. It's in your heart already. I know it. So this is what the king should do. Verse 15, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as a king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. He shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said unto you, you shall not return that way again. Verse 17, neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. Also it shall be written, also it shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, and that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. I've read that before. Yeah. Thought, yeah, okay, makes sense, tracks. But you know sometimes when you read scripture and God's dealing with you about something and you read it and you think, woof, how did I miss that? Yeah. Like, it's kind of a sucker punch <laughs> in a way. Yeah. God checks you in your spirit and he says, hey, remember this? Right. And you think, I wish I would have <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Why does he do that? Because he loves us. Uh -huh. Now, it doesn't feel good in the moment. The Bible says no chastisement feels good in the moment, but it's for our benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So I want to break this passage in Deuteronomy down a little bit. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. <clears throat> what did we read in, in Peter? You are a chosen generation. What did right. Pastor talk about 
the other night about, you know, getting our minds right from a biblical perspective. Yeah. You know, being so grounded in the word that when trials come, we don't have to go running off to yeah. experts to help us with our feelings. One of the things that she talked about was just walking in the mindset that you are chosen by God. That he has called you, that he has redeemed you, that he literally died so that you could live a new life and become a new creature. So that you could have another opportunity to fix some stuff. (laughs) To make better choices. But the Lord is going to choose the king. We don't just say, ah, I like what he's talking about. We're going to elevate him. Right? Right? God says, no. This is actually what you need. I know you think you need this. 17 gallons of ice cream, 32 packs of double-stuffed Oreos. What you actually need is a little bit of broccoli. (laughs) Now, I'm not, I love double stuffed Oreos and ice cream. I'm not picking on anybody. But broccoli's good too. And I found that out about, I don't know, five years ago. (laughs) Right? We have this idea of what we need. We have this idea of what is going to get us through. And God says, actually, this is what you need. And that's why it's important to seek His will first, to seek His kingdom first. Because if we're willing to receive what He is giving us, instead of rejecting it, that's going to put us farther ahead than if we try to go out and do it ourselves. That's more of that independent mindset. (coughs) This mindset that I don't need God, I can do that myself. Pastor Mueller was talking about that the other night, I believe, how take the small things to God. We think, oh, this is too small, I don't want to bother God with it. He's not bothered. He's got lots of time. (laughs) And he's pretty patient. Thank God for that. The next thing is that this king shall not (coughs) guide the people back to Egypt. He shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said, you shall not return this way again. Now, Egypt being a type and shadow, or a, uh, an, uh, a type and shadow, we'll just go with that instead of trying to think of the word, of sin, God takes the children of Israel, he delivers them from sin, puts it under the water, says, you're not going to go back to that. I'm taking you to the promised land. I'm taking you to the land flowing with milk and honey. The blessings, the provision of God, that's where I'm leading you. Why do you want to go back to the chains, the slavery, the having to, you know, the taskmaster says, this is your quota for the day. Uh Fulfill it or you're going to get beaten. Uh Right? And sin says, hey, you need to do this. You need to smoke this. You need to watch this. You need to say this. If we've been delivered, if that's been left under the water, why do we listen to it, right? Don't go back to Egypt, God is saying. The king, or, you know, if we are kings unto God, we shouldn't be leading people back to Egypt. That's right. That's right. I know you're having a rough time. Here, just try drinking. (laughs) Try what? Yeah. No. Yeah. We have the answers, right? God has been very gracious and given us a manual for every problem. That's what we should be leading people to. Don't give bad advice. This book has all the answers. The one who wrote this book has all the answers. We just need a little humility to, to accept that. Key word there being need. You have to have it. (laughs) 
Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. This is verse 17. <clears throat> Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible says, keep yourselves from idols. Yep. Yep. What's an idol? An idol is something that you worship that isn't really God. Yeah. Right. Now, in the Old Testament times, they literally built statues or figurines or fangs and said, ah, this is our God, yeah. right? <coughs> when the children of Israel come into the wilderness, Aaron gathers up all of this gold and he throws it into the fire and out pops this golden molten blob that he calls a lamb and says, ah, this is our God. This is who delivered us. Or a molten calf, not a lamb, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pulls him out of the fire and says, this is our God who delivered us from Egypt. And God's angry about that. Right. Says, that's not me. Yeah. That's junk. Yeah. 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 Amen. And so, when we start to say, this is what's going to deliver me from my problem. Alcohol is going to be what delivers me from my problem. Drugs is going to be what delivers me from my problem. Porn is going to be what delivers me from my problem. Being a good person is going to be what delivers me from my problem. You are following an idol. Jesus is the only thing that is going to deliver you from your problem. This word, which Jesus is the... Word made flesh, John 1, 14. Right. Don't follow after idols. Don't put stock in the things of this world. Don't put stock in the things that you think are right. Yep. Put stock in the thing that is right. <laughs> yep. This one is the one that really got me. Because I, okay, let me put some backstory to this, I suppose. I've been reading in the Old Testament. I've been in uh, First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles. Those four books talk about the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, what they did, how they acted from the time of, well, after Solomon onward until, I don't even know because I haven't I don't remember the, who the last one that it talks about is. but So that, that's been kind of my mindset. That's where I've been thinking a lot. And so this next, this next verse here, verse 18. It shall be when the king sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him and he shall read it all the days of his life. Yeah. Why? That he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. Why? That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. Every single king of Israel was commanded by the word of yeah. God yeah. to write the law, yeah. the Pentateuch. Yeah. What you read in Leviticus, what you read in Deuteronomy, what you read in Exodus, there's a little bit in there. All of that law that we read and think, man, this is really boring. <laughs> yeah. Write it. Hide it in your heart. Yeah, Read it all the days of your life. Yeah. I want to, Matt, I don't think it's in there, so I'll just tell the story. 2 Kings chapter 22 tells of a king named Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign as king. And in the 18th year of his reign, so he would have been 26, mm -hmm. 
when Josiah was 26 years old, he says, hey, the temple is really falling to pieces. Yeah. All of the money that we're getting in tithes and offerings from the people, take, he, he goes to the priests. He says, priests, I need you to go to Hilkiah. He's the high priest of, at the time. He says, go there and, and tell him to take all this money and start giving it to the workers in the temple and tell them to use that money to start rebuilding the temple. And here's something interesting. The Bible says that they didn't take any account of how much money it was because the people who were handling the money were faithful. We didn't have to worry about them, you know, skimming a little off the top. <laughs> they were faithful men. Praise God for faithful men and women. Absolutely. But the Bible says that Josiah did, he walked uprightly before God. He did what was right. He didn't do like Ahab. He didn't do like the other kings who built idols and groves and worshipped false gods. Right. right? It actually says that Josiah tore down, see his father was one of those kings that went and worshipped Baals and Ashtarah and junk. Yeah. It says Josiah went in and when he became king, he tore all that down. Eight years old. Now I'm sure it wasn't in the first year, but yeah. he knew who he was going to serve. Yeah. Amen. Sometimes I wonder if we do. Amen. Not, not us specifically, just in general. Yeah. That's why we spend so much time looking for something. Yeah. Right? Get this out of here. Yeah. That's why we spend so much time looking for something, because we don't know what we serve. Yeah. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Right. Right. But, sorry, sidetracked. The commandment was to write a copy of the book of the law Read it. Every king was supposed to do that. Josiah becomes king. When he sends Hilkiah the priest to go start refurbishing the temple and getting it up to, you know, a, a decent standard, Hilkiah comes back and he says, hey, we found this book, you know, kind of stuffed away in a corner, collecting cobwebs and dust, and he gives it to the, the messenger from Josiah, and the messenger takes it back to Josiah and begins to read it to him. Yeah. And... Josiah is like, whoa, we haven't been doing any of this. Yeah. We've just been doing what, what the last generation yeah. did. We've just been, it's just been tradition. It's just been word of mouth. There was, there was a book the whole time. Right. We could read it for ourselves and figure out what to do. We didn't have to take somebody else's word for it. Hence, he gets the whole nation back on track yeah. pretty well. Yeah. He was a good king. But to have that commandment written yeah. and then for no king to do it. Yeah. Another thing that the children of Israel never did, they never celebrated the year of Jubilee every 50 years. <coughs> if you had slaves, they were to go free. If you owned somebody else's property because they owed you a debt and that was the only way they could pay it, you were supposed to give it back to them. That's pretty big. The place where I work, you want to know how the government got that property? They came in and said, this is ours now. All the farmers, sorry, got to go. Now, biblically, 50 years later, that should have been given back. But I won't get into why our government doesn't do things biblically. <laughs> Write a copy of the law. Now, I'm not saying you have to do this. But how cool would it be to have a handwritten Bible yeah. in your house yeah. that you can hand to your children and say... Yeah, that's awesome. Like, not as a, hey, look what I did, but yeah. as a, hey, this is important. Yeah. 
This yeah. is like the, this is our values. Yeah. Yeah. I took the time to write it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Because he took the time to write it for us. Yeah. To think that, to think right. that it, it lasted in the temple being shoved away in a corner. Yeah. It was preserved. Yeah. Nobody had access to it, right? Well, they did, they just didn't realize it. Yeah. But it was being preserved through all of that. You think about the wars and the, all of the things that could have happened, and yet we still have this Bible today. That's right. yeah. That's right. That's yeah. You can't say God doesn't love us. Right. I better move on. I'm going to run out of time. So why do we write the word? Why do we keep the word? Why do we read the word? That his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left. Above being a hearer of the word, we can come in on Sunday, we can come in on Wednesday, we can spend time reading throughout the week, and we can hear the word a lot. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Right. But James says, you know, show me your faith, I will show you my faith by my works. We can hear the word, but we have to do the word. But it also says, don't be lifted up with pride among your brethren. And it's June 2nd today. Does anybody know what the month of June has been proclaimed to be in this God-fearing country that we claim to live in? We're going to get kicked off YouTube <laughs> with this one. <laughs> Pride does go before destruction. Right. Welcome to Pride Month, where we have chosen to worship the idol, the false god, the ridiculous notion yep. that we are sufficient, yep. yeah. You're right. that our choices are end-all, be-all, right. and that everybody has to bow down to what we say and that's just too bad. And there are people who are going to disagree with me, and I don't care. What does David say? <laughs> I didn't understand all of this stuff, but then I went to the house of the Lord, and I saw their end. You know what? If you're going to disagree with me, I know the path you're on, and I don't want any part of it. I refuse to worship my own pride. I refuse to worship my own... You're right. <laughs> I need to stop. Micah 6 and 8. God has showed you, O oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk what? Pridefully with your God? Humbly. Right. Humbly with your God. Psalm 1, 1 and 3, 1 through 3. The way of the righteous and the end of the ungodly. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsels of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, verse 2. And in his law he meditates day and night, verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, yeah. and whatever he does shall prosper. So, don't be prideful. Don't be a Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Right. What was Nebuch Nebuchadnezzar's problem? He built this big statue, however many feet tall, gold. He says, when, when you hear the music play, fall down and worship this statue. Yeah. Oh, by the way, the statue is an image of me. 
Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's pride. If you yeah. <laughs> need a definition, there it is. <laughs> what did God do to Nebuchadnezzar? He said, I'm going to take the kingdom from you. Yep. He sent Nebuchadnezzar out into the fields on days kind of like today. He said, you're going to eat grass. No more steak for you, my friend. The dew's going to be on your back. You're going to grow hair and be like a beast of the field. He literally turned him into an animal. Or rather, Nebuchadnezzar's choices literally turned him into an animal. Turned him into a beast. Turned him into a base thing. But what did he learn through this? He learned humility. And through his humility that he learned, God brought him back. And if you read through the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar even got to write scripture. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is what happened, which is what I just told you. Don't be Saul. Saul, who was small in his own eyes and did well, eventually became lifted up with pride started offering sacrifices that he was not qualified to offer. (coughs) Which is going to lead me into the next point. I don't know if I should. (laughs) Maybe I should save it for next week. I got five minutes. Should I go or save it? Save it. What does it mean to be a priest unto God? I really thought I was going to zip through this in like ten minutes. (laughs) I could pull a Pastor Alphen and say, I've been preaching for about 12 minutes now and go for another. (laughs) No, no. That was really funny, though. Walk humbly. Matt, can you put up Micah 6 and 8 again? The Lord has shown you what to do, O man, what is good and what he's requiring of you. Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Don't fall for the lie that pride is the new thing that everybody needs to be doing. No, no, no. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Last thing, Elisha, when Elijah was ascending up into heaven, and Elijah said to Elisha, what is it that you want? And Elisha said, I want a double portion of your spirit. Here's something I've been praying recently alongside the send forth laborers into the harvest. You know, these prayers the pastor has said we we need to be praying. Here's one that I've been praying. Give me a double portion of humility. Fun fact, for those of you who didn't know, I struggle with pride. Now, not the type of pride that's being celebrated this month. (laughs) Never been a homosexual. (laughs) Put that out there. But I have a tendency to say, my way or the highway. You can ask my wife. (laughs) Gets me in trouble a lot. (laughs) And that's something to take note of. Those times when you listen to your flesh, how often does it get you in trouble? Those times when you listen to this word, how often does it get you in trouble? Right. And I don't mean trouble with somebody being mad at you. I mean like serious trouble in your life, problems, issues, yeah. things that can't be corrected. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm, I'm done. Got some announcements for you. Next week, we will be continuing with this and we will talk about what it means to be a priest unto God. Other announcements. Mother's Memorial. Donations are due July 24th. If you have questions, see Sister Chris. District Conference is this this week. Wednesday through Saturday. Bless you. Wednesday, there will be no service here. It's the first Wednesday of the month, supposed to be youth night. We will not be having service. 
We will be having service in York at the Holthus. If you need directions, please ask somebody in leadership. But services will be held June 5th through the 8th. They're starting at 10 in the morning. They're going until whenever they're done at night. But the evening service starts at 7. If you'd like to, we would like for you to come. Absolutely. It's always a good time. Absolutely. We want to make sure that we are in prayer for Israel. Amen. We want to make sure that we are in prayer for this nation. I shouldn't say it. Never mind. Is that wisdom? I don't know. <laughs> don't forget that <laughs> daughter's wearing sunglasses in church. <laughs> my, my. Don't forget on the table in back, we have cards to fill out. If you have a prayer request, if you have a praise report, feel free to fill one of those out. We want to make sure that we're praying for one another. Amen. Those three points that we touched on this morning before getting into Sunday school, let's give God thanks for one another. Amen. When we're making our petition, let's petition God for the needs of somebody else. We have needs, but so do other people. And then when you're petitioning God for those needs, maybe there's some of those needs that you can fulfill. James said, if you see your brother and he needs a jacket and you're wearing two jackets, don't just pray for him and go on your merry way. Yeah. Give him a jacket. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, be in prayer. Pray without ceasing. Matt, if you can put up our last two slides. If you're able to stand, please do. We're going to move into a time of worship and give God praise. We are a spirit-filled church focused on connecting with others. We serve our community through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We grow in our personal walk with God as well as discipling others. And we show the love of Christ to all we need.